Well, one of us is punctual, <laughs> at least. Right, let's read, shall we, again in John's Gospel, please. I want to just take up further two imperatives of the Lord Jesus. I'm not going to deal with all seven, and uh, I'll be on another subject, God willing, tomorrow. But I will present you with just uh, a couple more of these delightful imperatives from this upper room ministry. Now, so far, we've had abiding in Christ. That came in chapter 15 and verse 4. We've dealt with loving one another. That's acting in compassion in chapter 13. There are some others. I'll just mention them to you for those of you who like a complete set of notes. Chapter 15 and 20, there's another command here. It says, remember the word that I said unto you. So that's a command to bring to remembrance what Christ had said. And you'll notice that the teachings of the Lord that he particularly wants them to remember are as follows. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And if they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So I call that the command to anticipate conflict in the sense of persecution. So you have abiding in Christ, you have acting in compassion, and you have anticipating conflict. Now, chapter 16, this is where I pause, and well, I wouldn't, but allow you to shout out the alliteration. Anyway, chapter 16, that's if I was teaching children in a school, I might have done that, but I don't do that any longer. Acts chapter 16. Now, we'll deal with this tonight, verse 23. And in that day, Ye shall ask me nothing. When the Lord Jesus speaks about that day in the upper room ministry, he is speaking about the day in which we live. He is speaking about the day of the spirit, essentially. In that day, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Now, this is the imperative here. Ask, and the thought is really, keep on asking. Keep on requesting, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. So I call that ask without ceasing, because the tense of the word is to keep on asking. Now, chapter 14. This combines two commandments, and I call it assurance in view of the coming of Christ. Verse 1, this is a command, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. And this is another imperative, but they go together in terms of assurance. Let not your heart be troubled, command. Believe in God. Believe also in me, command. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Literally, I am coming again, and I will receive you unto myself. But where I am, not where you are, he says, where I am, there ye may be also. So that is assurance, the command to be assured in view of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, I just need to tie in verse 27 because you have the command, the same command as verse 1, repeated. So verse 27 of chapter 14 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. And here is the repetition of the command from verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So those are two commandments in one, but that really is number 5 and number 6. So the last command, we should just read that, I think, is at the end of chapter 14, and we may well not quite get here. But verse 31, 
or rather verse 30, hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. And this is the command, arise and let us go hence. So that's the command, obviously, to arise. And I like to make an application there and just call that arise in consecration. And certainly the Lord Jesus was going out, wasn't he, in consecration and devotion to his Father's will. Now that's all we'll read and look to the Lord, as always, for his blessing. Now you might just like to turn to chapter 16. Uh, I haven't got any long and convoluted introductions tonight. But chapter 16, I want to deal with verse 23 and 24, ask without ceasing. In fact, when the Lord Jesus comes to verse 23 and he runs all the way down to verse 28 in this particular small section of the upper room ministry, what he is doing here is he is giving a summary of the new dispensation that was about to unfold. And so, as I've said, verse 23, in that day he is talking in particularly in particular of the day of the spirit now of course you know about the day of god the day of god deals with and is coextensive with eternity we often speak about the day of christ or we speak of the day of the lord and when we speak about the day of the lord we're thinking in particular about his coming in judgment it includes the tribulation but also his millennial reign so we speak of the day of God and the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. But before all of those days, we are living in this particular day, which is characterized by the spirit of God. So we are living in the day of the spirit. And of course, that began in Acts chapter two, when the spirit of God descended and took up his residence. A divine person moved on the day of Pentecost. The Lord Jesus had gone back to heaven, from earth to heaven. A divine person had moved 10 days before. And then on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, a, day, a divine person moved again, but this time from heaven, and he came down to earth. So we're living in a day when the Spirit of God has taken up his residence in, dwells individually, every believer in Christ, and he indwells the church so we're living in the day of the spirit and the Lord Jesus is talking about that day. And he's had much to say about the comforter and the ministry of another comforter, which is the spirit of God. So listen to what he says. He says in that day. This is the day in which we are living. He says, you will ask me. Nothing. So that seems to be a rather strange statement. Now, you will bear in mind that these disciples, all they have known, all they have known is to be alongside physically the person of Christ. They were his disciples. They had given up everything to follow him. And day after day after day, they woke up with him. They conversed with him. Any questions they have, any difficulties, any problems, they spoke to the Lord about it. Because the Lord could deal with any of these difficulties. And now at the end of that time, as he goes to the cross and ultimately ascends to the Father, they are not going to be in the same kind of relationship with him as they had been for three and a half years. Now they're going to be in a spiritual relationship with him. Doesn't mean to say, by the way, that he wouldn't be with them. And doesn't either mean to say that they couldn't commune with him every day or ask him the same question. They could, but it would be in a spiritual sense. So there's a spiritual relationship here. So he says, in that day, you will ask me nothing. But rather, he says, now what a remarkable statement this is. Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father. So he is bringing them into an altogether new and different relationship. Now they will have a personal approach to the father. 
He says, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name. Now, it's in his name because he's not with them any longer. He's in heaven. So because he is personally absent from them, when it is that they request and ask of the Father, then they will do it in the name of the Lord Jesus because he is absent. Look again at verse 26. At that day ye shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. So this personal approach to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. That was going to be very, very different. Mm. By the way, it's lovely just to read through the Gospels and notice all of the different difficulties that the disciples brought before the Lord. You know, if they had a personal difficulty, well, they would take it to him. And most often in the Gospels, you will read of the fact that they had spiritual difficulties. They had doctrinal difficulties because they had questions and the Lord said things and they just couldn't comprehend them. And they took them to him. And sometimes they had practical difficulties. Even when the Lord says with a crowd of 5,000 men, besides women and children, and he says to them, well, where should we buy? Where should we buy bread that these may eat? That's a problem of some practical difficulty. And ultimately, they had to take it to him. But says the Lord Jesus, there's a day coming. And he says, upon my death, upon my resurrection, upon my ascension. Now listen to this. I will introduce you to the Father's presence. How remarkable. We are living in such a blessed, privileged day. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 puts it like this. We have, as believers in Christ, access unto the Father. Mm. Remarkable. When you're in the epistle to the Hebrews, we can have boldness to enter in beyond and through the veil. Well, that was never the case before. You never went apart from the high priest on one occasion every year on the day of the You never went beyond the veil, whether the tabernacle or the temple. That was the very expression and throne and presence of God beyond the veil. You never went beyond the veil, says the Lord Jesus. There's a day coming when I am going to introduce you into the presence of the Father. Isn't that remarkable? Have you thought of the power of prayer? Have you thought of the privilege of prayer? To have boldness. To enter into the very immediate presence of God. And to present our petitions. It's remarkable. But says the Lord Jesus, you don't just pray or ask in any old way. He says, verse 24. He says, you will ask, but you must ask in my name. Go on asking. Keep on asking. But in my name. I'll say this very reverently, but when we pray, we are praying essentially as representatives of the Lord Jesus here on earth. We as believers and as Christians have the privilege of continuing the work that began with the Lord Jesus. And with he in heaven, when it is we pray, we pray as his representatives. It is almost as if we are taking the son's place before the father. And therefore, as we pray, we should pray as he would have prayed. And we should pray according to his will and his mind. And the kind of principle, 
Now, I know that there are prayers that we, as failing human, in, human beings and individuals, I know there are prayers that we must pray that he never needed to pray. I understand that. But we take the principle that the principle Christ used in prayer always is the kind of principle that we should use as we ask in his name. So we ask as he would ask. And you say, well, what was the kind of guiding principle that the Lord Jesus always used when he prayed? I'll tell you. He always prayed according to the glory, for the glory of his Father. Now, if we prayed like that, we would find that in asking, we would receive. And we would find that in receiving, our joy would be full. Could I ask you just to think about that? That when you pray, it's, it's so, we always want to put our petitions and urgent desires first, don't we? And just launch into, Lord, I need this, and I need that, and this is my great desire. Just think about this. Could Christ pray the kind of prayer that you're praying? Does what you're praying tend towards, ultimately, the glory of the Father? That is what should characterise our prayers. So we need to live in close fellowship with Christ, don't we? And we need to live in close fellowship with the Father and with his word, so that when we pray, we are praying according to the word of God and praying according to the mind of Christ. That's what it is to pray in his name. Now, you understand then why the Lord Jesus says, if you are praying in this way, verse 24, keep on asking in this way, and it's a guarantee, ye shall receive. That's answered prayer. Now, as we've said, there is condition attached to it. In my name. You remember James? He says, you ask, but you don't receive. And why don't they receive? You say that seems to be contradictory to this passage because you're asking to consume it upon your lust. You're praying for your own selfish desires and lusts. You ask, but you don't receive. God help us to pray according to the glory of God. And in receiving answers to prayer, says the Lord Jesus, your joy will be full. You will have abundant pleasure. It's the thought now of a cup being filled up to the brim and overflowing. When you ask and ask and ask according to the glory of the Father and the answers and answers and answers, you'll be full to overflowing with joy. Now, if my father was here, he's not. 81 just the other day, fighting fit. But if he was here, he would talk to you about his prayer diary. I think it's a good exercise. He would fill a page every day. And he would be listing in his diary, line by line. I prayed for this today. I prayed for this today. This has been on my mind today. And every week he'd go back through. And he'd highlight. And he would tick it. And he would say, answered answered god answered fills him with joy you know to have a highlighted prayer diary we forget don't we how good god is how gracious he is you think of the numerous things you pray for every day i hope you do and god very often will give us exactly those things we ask for it fills you with joy we should be joyous I don't necessarily say happy, joyous Christians. We should be when we see God answering prayer. Oh. Ask without ceasing. Now, you wanted me to get here, and I just want to deal with this. Back to chapter 14. Let's talk about assurance in view of the coming of Christ. Now, we love these verses, don't we? And it's, uh, there are good verses just to leave you with. 
Chapter 14 and verse 1 says the Lord Jesus, let not your heart be troubled. So I wish it was that easy. Interesting. This is a command. Now, I know that I will be speaking to believers here in the hall tonight. And perhaps believers who are online. And you have been experiencing over the past 18 months and still today. Very difficult circumstances in life. And now the Lord Jesus commands us. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. He's going to say it twice. In fact, he will say it three times in the upper room ministry. But we read the other reference in verse 27. Don't let your heart be shaken, troubled. Don't let it be disturbed, agitated. It's like the wind blowing across the open ocean. Do not allow your hearts to be agitated and disturbed. Now, some context. Why is it that these disciples might well be agitated and disturbed? Well, bear in mind that not only has the Lord Jesus told them that he is leaving them. Now, that's going to make them troubled. He has also revealed that there is a traitor in their midst. And they had to question amongst one another as to who it was. You can understand that they were troubled. They were agitated. There's been a traitor amongst us all these years. And now, Christ, you're leaving us. So you can understand why it was that they were troubled. And the Lord says, don't be troubled. Three times. Do you remember that in John chapter 12? The Lord Jesus had said, my soul is troubled. Do you remember in chapter 13, as he spoke about a traitor, he had said, my spirit is troubled. If there was anyone who had the right with impending circumstances in view to be troubled. It was him. It was Christ. And yet with all of that, he takes these hours. You know, we're hours away from Calvary. He takes this time to ensure that his disciples would not be troubled. In the light of all that's about to unfold. He's still seeking their comfort. So there's one command, and we'll come to the reason behind the command in a moment. Let not your heart be troubled. Now, what about the next statement? You know these words off by heart. I wonder if we understand them. Do not let your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. It could be, sometimes the Greek is ambiguous, that could be a statement of fact. You are believers in God. That's what you are. Now, he says, also be believers in me. But I rather think this is not a statement of fact. This is another command. So he says, your hearts are troubled and agitated, but have confidence in God. It's a great thing, isn't it? And don't just have confidence in God. He says, have confidence in me. Now, could you have a clearer statement of deity? Well, there are many clear statements of deity in relation to the Lord Jesus. But what a statement. Who would dare to put themselves alongside God as an object of trust? Could you imagine me saying to you, I know there's been COVID for 18 months, but have confidence in God. That's a good thing to say. And have confidence in me. I'll never let you down. I couldn't say such a thing. I would let you down. But Christ can. So he sets himself alongside God as an object of trust and confidence. I want to say this to you. It seems as if the world is falling apart at the seams. And this is not just pandemic. This is fuel 
Now in Scotland, you seem to be all right, but let me tell you, this morning when I was driving to Heathrow at six o'clock, every petrol station, tailbacks for best part of a mile, in every one of them, they weren't closed. And if it's not fuel, it's electricity and gas prices. And if it's not that, it's food. And if it's not that, it's Brexit. And you say the world is falling apart at the seams. And the Lord Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. He says, have confidence in God. Because he's in control. Now, this is Daniel's prophecy. We've been listening to it. God is in control. And not only is God in control, but his son is also the object of our confidence. Now, do you see that there are three reasons here why you and I should not lose confidence in God? Here are the reasons. Verse two, there's a place. Don't be troubled. Have confidence in God because there's a place that's been prepared for you and me. Hallelujah. Next, verse three, there's a person who is coming. Don't be troubled, will you? Have confidence in God and his Christ. Why? Because there's a place which has been prepared for us that's beyond this world, that's eternal. And thank God there's a person coming who's going to take us to that place. And something else. And that's down at the end of verse 27. Peace I leave with you and my peace. Isn't it beautiful? In the meantime, with this great hope of a place and a coming person, he says, in the meantime, I've given you a gift. And this gift is peace. You allow me to talk about those three things. Isn't it quite incredible? Verse two, in my father's house. Are many mansions, that is abiding places, abodes, resting places. He says, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go. I am going to prepare a place for you. Wonderful to think that in the saddest and most sorrowful of all circumstances. The night before he left this scene. He poured the comfort of a scene beyond this world into their hearts. A place that he was going to prepare. In my father's house. What do you think about the father's house? I love the way in which I know some people don't see this as heaven. I do. I'll give you some reasons why in a moment. I love to see the way in which heaven is described in the Bible. Sometimes it's described as a place, a country, because it's vast. Sometimes it's described as a city, because it's full of people saved by the grace of God. Sometimes it's described as a garden, a paradise, in the midst of which is the tree of life. But here it's being described as my father's house. Not in John chapter two. You see, you read of my father's house twice in John's gospel. The first time is in John chapter two. They had made my father's house and house of merchandise. So certainly the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. That's John chapter two. So certainly the father's house in the early days of John's gospel was the temple. But now because of their rejection of Christ, their house was left unto them desolate. And now the Lord Jesus is taking that description and applying it, I take it, to heaven. A place which is being prepared 
by the Lord Jesus. Now, just note this. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. That does not involve, and I speak reverently, his action. It's not that he has been preparing and is still preparing almost as if he is building a place for us to go. Not at all. It's not so much action, it's his presence. That place was prepared the instant a risen man went to glory. It was ready. It was prepared. The father's house was now heavenly. There is a man who is in the glory. And his presence in the glory guarantees that others will follow. He's the forerunner. And we too are going to the father's house. Mr. Leckie used to say, his blood shed at Calvary prepares the people. His bodily presence in heaven prepares the place. Now, why is it called the Father's house? Well, oh, take up the thought of the temple. The temple was a place of communion. The temple was a place of worship. The temple was a place of the divine presence. That's what heaven will be like. Forever in the presence of God the Father. Enjoying the worship of that place and the communion of that place. But the Father's house turns up in Luke's gospel too. You notice that? Luke 15. As a prodigal son who's gone into a far country. And he's spent all his living on, on, on riotous living. And he, he comes to himself, doesn't he? That's repentance. He, he, he comes to his mind. He comes back to the Father. And he's received into the father's house. And the thought there in Luke 15 is love. And joy. And provision. And welcome. This is what the father's house means to us. And the Lord Jesus says, don't be agitated. Don't be afraid. Have confidence. Because there's a place of worship. Communion. The presence of God. There's a place of joy, love, compassion, forgiveness. He says there's such a place to which we are going. But what about this abodes, mansions? You haven't mocked up in your mind a particular pearly, marble-clad mansion that you would like to have in heaven, have you? Surely not. In my father's house are many dwelling places. Whenever I speak on this verse, I can't help but point out this. Those abodes or dwelling places are mentioned in one other place in scripture. You know, it's in the same chapter. And in fact, you'll find it down towards the end of verse 23. In what I think is one of the most remarkable promises in the word of God. Jesus answered and said, if a man loved me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we <clears throat> will come unto him and make our abode that's the word mm. with him mm. isn't it incredible to think that in this day the believer is an abode yeah. of the trinity Father, Son, Spirit. But we can know true communion with the Godhead, especially as we live in obedience to the word of God. Abode. And that's the same word. And the Lord Jesus says, in my Father's house, there are many abodes. So surely there's the thought of dwelling in the presence of deity. But remember that the earthly temple, it also had abodes. You see, it had little rooms that were built onto the side of the temple. And these rooms were essentially accommodation for the priests and the Levites who used to serve in the temple. How apt and applicable for a holy priesthood and a royal priesthood. We're going to spend eternity in the Father's house. So let not your heart be troubled. Have confidence in God because there's a place. 
to which he is taking us. Verse 3, there's a person who's taking us there. He says, if I go, now there's no doubt about that. Read it like this. Since I go and prepare a place for you, I will or I am coming again and I will receive you unto myself. Can you see the certainty in that statement? Since I go, brethren, he's gone. He says, not I will. He says, I am. I am coming. Now, that is certainty, but it's also imminency. He's coming quickly. He says, I am at the present time. I am coming. I trust we believe that. Could be caught away to meet the Lord Jesus even tonight. Yes. He says, I am coming quicker. And Lord, what are you going to do? He's going to receive us unto himself. The word receive for you Greek scholars, para. That's a preposition alongside, para lambana. To take alongside. To take us near to himself. You could translate it like this. I am coming to take you by the hand. Isn't that personal? You say the rapture can't be personal. You know? how, how many millions are going to be caught away into the air at the same time? And we might be able to see the Lord from a distance and we'll recognize some of the glory. This is very personal. Amen. He says, since I go, I am coming. And he says, when I come, I'm going to take you by the hand. And I'm going to take you to glory. Now, don't be troubled, will you? You have confidence in Christ. He's coming to take you by the hand and to lead you to glory. And thank God he said, he said, verse 3, that where I am, there you can. He did not say where you are, we will be. This is not the manifestation. This is not Christ coming to the earth. He doesn't say, I'm coming to be with you where you are. Hallelujah. He says, I'm coming that where I am. Where I am. He's in the Father's house, it's prepared that where I am, you may be also. Let me close by saying this. Verse 27. This is the third aspect of this commandment not to be troubled, to have confidence. It's assurance in view of his coming. Not only is there a place, not only is there a person, but there is peace. He says, in the meantime, Peace, I leave with you. That is, he is leaving peace for us as a gift. Then he says, my peace. Literally, the peace, the mine. My peace, I give unto you. So he is leaving peace as a gift. He is giving peace as a possession. And it's the peace, the mine, the peace that was especially his when he was here. He says, I'm giving it to you. Or oh, he doesn't give us the world gift. He doesn't give in a miserly fashion. He doesn't give grudging. He gives liberally. And he gives his peace. You say, what was his peace? When Christ was here, when he walked amongst men, that particular peace that was his, that he's given to us, what is it? Well, I'll tell you, it just, it, it's just in the context. You'll see from the context and what we're talking about, it was just this. That in the midst of the most difficult and trying of circumstances, <clears throat> Christ always had unbroken communion with his father. 
And he always had perfect confidence in his father. And despite everything that happened, now, of course, he had communion with his father every morning. And he knew as the omnipotent one all that lay before. And despite the most difficult of circumstances, he could rest in the will of the father with absolute confidence. That is peace. Christ says, my peace I give. It's tranquility in the midst of the storm. Now, I was not an art teacher. That is the last thing I could possibly teach. I have no artistic bent in my body or bone in my body, as my mother would say. But I heard the story, well, this is typical of art teachers, by the way. I'm sure they just dream these things up on the spot. But I heard the story of an art teacher that went to her class. Did I call her a hearse? I'm sorry. She went to her class and she said, now listen, class, today, I would like you to draw or paint or represent peace. Oh, it's awful, isn't it? That's like, you know, that's the most, uh, I, you know, if I wasn't such a, a lovely young man, I probably would have walked out of the class <laughs> if, if the teacher is, draw peace. Well, you know what, they, most of the class, well, what would you have produced? I don't know. Most of the class produced a very tranquil scene. The sea, the rising or the setting sun, the cliffs, very still trees, just a, a scene of peace and beauty and quiet, like you see in Cornwall day after day. But the winner, because she made it a competition, was the child that drew a raging torrent of a waterfall. You say, that's not peace. But in the corner of the waterfall, tucked away under a crevice, hidden from the torrent and from the water vapor and from the raging storm, a little bird, just tucked away in the crevice, sheltered safe in the rock, tranquility, peace. In the midst of the most difficult and trying of circumstances. That's it. That's the peace. I want to leave you by saying this. <clears throat> Don't let your heart be troubled. In the light of this world. Don't lose confidence in your God. In your <coughs> saviour. Why? Because there's a place to which we're going. And there's a person who's coming to take us there. And in the meantime, rest. Have confidence in God and perfect confidence in the Father that he knows what's good for you and good for me. And he will see us through. Safe to glory in a day to come, maybe today. Well, God will bless his word to us. Amen. Amen.